The Wonder Lab at the National Railway Museum is a great place for young and old to learn. Not just history, but practical physics. There are experiments covering all sorts of things a railway engineer would have to consider. For example, aerodynamics between different locomotive designs, bridge building, and how train wheels work. I was wandering around near the back of the lab one day when I heard a pop, followed closely by another smaller pop, and something clattering to the ground nearby. It was a ping pong ball. The poor volunteer at the other side of the Wonder Lab went a lovely shade of red. But rather than being annoyed at him for launching a projectile near my head, I was rather impressed that with just a little bit of air pressure, he had shot that ball a clear 50 feet. It just showed the raw power of air. So imagine the energy potential when hot air is mixed with steam and this gave rise to a very special piece of equipment called the steam turbine. But for us to look at the steam turbine we would have to leave the tracks for a moment and head towards the sea where steam turbines were and in some cases are the norm. Steam turbines are machines that turn kinetic energy like steam and air into mechanical energy. The process starts with the heating of water to make steam. The steam is put under high pressure and it is directed to the turbine. A turbine is made from a mix of static rotors called stators and rotors that move. The steam hits the stator first. The blades are made in such a way that it directs the steam to the optimal location for the moving blades. The moving blades are aerodynamically shaped, kind of like a wing and as the steam hits it, it creates lift and the blade moves upwards, moving a central axle and ready to power, in some marine case, a propeller. The steam is then directed to another stator and the process continues again and again and again. But can these turbines power other things, like a locomotive? William Stanier seemed to think so. By the early 1930s, the LMS was facing a crisis. Its policy of smaller engines was beginning to bite them. The LNER was outcompeting them in not only speed, but also with customers. The A3 classes were beyond compare, and the Gresley's experiments with streamlining was causing a stir amongst the other big three. They knew Gresley had something big brewing, so Stania needed a head start. Based on an earlier design from 1922, a new class called the Princess Royal class was developed. The first two were standard four-cylinder locomotives, but he pulled the chassis of the third one to one side. In 1932, William took a trip to Sweden, where he had heard of a successful experiment with locomotives using turbines. It was promising. Turbines were proving more efficient with less moving parts and using less fuel. While the new engines wouldn't be any record breakers when it came to speed, the ride behind the engine would be smoother, running the engine would be cheaper and it would have a similar power to the current A3s. When number 6202 came out of the works, it was striking to say the least. Its congelated valve gear was gone in place of a simple drive. On the left side, a turbine would sit where the cylinder would be, and inside the cab, the fireman's job would remain unchanged, but the driver, instead of a regulator, there was now a control box. It was simple enough. Turn it one way and the steam would be directed to the forward turbine. If the engine needed to run in reverse, a secondary turbine would then engage. The only other difference was the oil pump. Because the turbine runs even after the running day is over, the oil supply to the turbine had to be closely monitored, sometimes even consistently run. The locomotive passed all relevant tests and was put to work between London and Liverpool along the West Coast main line. And at first glance, it was doing rather well. It climbed hills, it performed well at 60 mile an hour on average, and for the customers, it was a smooth rider. But as such a success as Tania predicted, the engine was not as economical as first thought. It was still better than most coal locomotives, but it wasn't enough to warrant the building of a second. 
And it was a good thing too, as the turbine proved a little finicky. Because of the lack of cylinders, the crew found that the blast pipe wasn't enough to remove the steam and smoke from the front of the engine. It was a common fault with many steam engines, and luckily the solution was simple, and the engine gained a set of smoke deflectors to help move the smoke away. In addition, the driver and the fireman found the cab to be smoky and dusty than other locomotives, likely caused by the poor draft. The turbine itself was causing its own problems, most occurred with the reverse turbine and the lack of lubrication. At one point the engine spent nearly 150 days in the works getting repaired and because the engine was bespoke it was usually not an easy fix with made to measure parts and people available with the special skills to fix it. The engine was still in service throughout the war however a main turbine failure in 1949 would set it aside. British Rail, who had now inherited the engine, were interested in standardisation rather than unique and decided that it was a good time to pull the plug on the turbine project. The engine reappeared three years later as Princess Anne. While being classed as a princess, the engine had several unique features including modified motion and new cylinders. Finally, a coat of green paint finished the look and she was unveiled as number 46202. Sadly though, the engine would only see 8 weeks of service. The engine was scheduled to doublehead an express with Jubilee cast number 45637 Windward Island on an express run from London to Manchester. It would never make it and it would become part of the worst rail disaster during peacetime. It was scrapped shortly afterwards. Steam turbines would not grace British Rails again, however this was not the end of the turbine story. Gas turbines were actually trialled in the 1960s with limited success, and of course the APT was also gas turbine powered. However in other countries they had much more luck, especially in America, Russia and Canada where the use of gas turbines was being experimented on even today. The UK is very much exploring the use of greener and more efficient ways to travel along the network. When I was in Derby, I had the privilege of seeing the UK's first hydrogen powered train called Hydroflex and turbines are still alive on the lines, not powering trains but powering station lights and smaller structures using wind power instead of steam. It's nowhere near what Stania had envisioned, but the technology is still around and still serving a purpose across the network.